And you're going to hear a lot more about this, but we are starting a new worship series um, on the book of James. And so um, perhaps you brought your Bible with you this morning. Um, if you did, great. Maybe you have your phone or your iPad. Um, just invite you to bring your Bible, particularly over the next five weeks, because we will be engaging scripture through a, through a study of um, the book of James. So looking at James chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, let's hear what the Spirit has to say to God's people this morning. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes and the dispersion, Greetings. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Isn't that, isn't that what, we, what we feel, right, when we're going through trials? Nothing but joy. Amen? Maybe that's why we're here. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you is lacking in wisdom... Ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Let the believer who is lowly boast in being raised up, and the rich in being brought low, because the rich will disappear like a flower in the field. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the field. Its flowers falls and its beauty perishes. It is the same way with the rich. In the midst of a busy life, they will wither away. This is James' version of you can't take it with you. Amen? Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one has stood the test and will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. Then when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my beloved. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, Jesus Christ, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for indeed, gracious Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Christ, amen. Well, I do hear it often from people who are new to the Christian faith, or perhaps um, it's folks who have been part of a church community for a while, but they feel maybe as though it's time for the next step in their relationship with God. Or perhaps they even feel as though that relationship with Christ has grown a bit stale. And so they'll come to me with essentially some version of this question. They, they, know, they, they say, I want to grow in my faith, and I know that the Bible should somehow be a part of that. Um, but where do I start? Because it can be kind of difficult to engage um, the scriptures um, at times. I remember um, a young adult, she was in university her sophomore year. She had had an experience of faith through like a university kind of experience at her school. And she came back um, for the summer and during Sunday worship, she like held up this brand new leather bound Bible. You know, it had that fresh Bible smell, that new Bible smell. And she was like, I'm going to start reading the scriptures. I'm so excited. I can't wait. I'm just going to grow in my relationship with God. And I was like, that's wonderful. And the next week I saw her and her eyes were like glazed over. And she was holding the Bible and she said, I'm in the book of Leviticus. Amen. So she'd gone Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. And I could see she sort of held on to the rails. She was about to jump biblical ship, 
right? And I said, don't jump. You need to start with the Gospel of John, read a chapter, and read like two Psalms a day. Yeah, and then get into a small group as soon as possible. And maybe like in about five years, you want to go back to the book of Leviticus. Amen? So, you know, it can, it can be... It can be a challenge to know where do you start when you know that scripture is sort of a key part of this relationship that we have with Christ. You know, within the United Methodist Church tradition, we hold up that there really are four sort of authorized sources by which we form our theology, which is basically how we understand God and Christ and the church and what does living out our faith look like. The very first one is scripture. It is the word of God that shapes our image of God and how we understand the call in our life. Um, the second one is tradition. This is basically like our track record of, of Christians for the last 2,000 plus years and even longer with our Jewish roots. Um, and so the tradition includes um, you know, saints who have gone before us, all the writings and the hymns and the, the teachings and even our current stances as a United Methodist Church. That's the tradition in a larger sense. Um, then the third thing, so you've got scripture and tradition, reason. You belong, or we are a part, the United Methodist Church, of a tradition that expects you will bring the brain that God gave you to the table of faith. Um, this was proved last service at 8.30. I got into two debates with people in the hallway immediately following the sermon. Amen? You are expected to bring the intellect that God has given you to engage the scriptures and think about the things of faith. And that is an important thing. Um, the last one is, is your experience. Each one of us have had unique experiences of the ever-constant God. And that shapes the way that we understand faith and mercy and justice and what God has asked us to do. So scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. But in our, in our polity, our book of discipline as United Methodist Christians, um, or Christians who happen to be United Methodist, we say this, that scripture is primary as we seek to discern um, about God and matters of Christian life. So why is scripture our first port of call when it comes to the life of faith? It has to do with accountability. It has to do with accountability. Um, we recognize that without an authority outside of ourselves, we will essentially author a gospel ourselves for our lives. Amen. <laughs> it will be the gospel according to Darcy. Without an, an, an exterior authority that sort of calls me back to life and to being. Um, it will be a, 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 a gospel with me at the center rather than Christ, or we will allow someone else to write our ethical and moral co code for us. I was reminded of this. I was, um, I was shopping at a, um, a mall in, when we lived in Idaho, and I was in a store, and I was perusing the sale rack, and Two of the saleswomen were behind the counter. One had pulled out their lunch, and they were eating it. And they were discussing something of importance in one of their lives. And I heard them discuss, you know, overhearing conversations are just so interesting, aren't they? Amen? Just, um, you just have to be mindful. Um, but I was listening, and um, they land, one of the women landed with, she said this, well, you just have to be thankful for what you've been given. And the other woman said, yes. It's like that saying from the Bible. Dance like no one's watching. Sing like no one's listening. And love like there is no tomorrow. And I don't know why, maybe because I was wearing a cross. She looked at me, she goes, isn't that in the Bible? And I said, I think it's a country song actually. But, <laughs> but you know, it's rather benign, right? But in essence, without scripture to sort of hold us accountable, we will all write our own gospel. You know, the book of James in, in one of the scriptures that we read, it said that every generous act, every perfect gift is from above. It's from God. You know, and without an exterior authority in our lives, a go-to, we may even place one of those good gifts at the center of our lives. Things like our children or our spouse or our work. Now, these are good gifts they just don't belong at the center of the orbit. 
You know, that is reserved um, in order to really know wholeness and fullness and abundance of life. That is reserved for God, not for us, and not for even any of the good gifts that God has provided. So to my, back to my first point, it can be challenging to engage the scriptures. After all, the Bible um, was, is, a, is a collection, it's a library of 66 books. It was written over a time span of 1,500 years, some 3,500 years ago. And so it can be a challenge. So I think, I believe, I have come um, to be convinced that one of the most effective ways you can engage scripture for sort of fruitfulness is to engage it with other people. Definitely within a small group. I mean, can I get an amen? How many of you have found that? You know, that if, when you are with a group of people, that that is when the scriptures can sort of come alive. So that's what we're doing here for the next five weeks. We are in a communal book study of the book of James. Um, we're going to ingest one chapter of a week. So I'm going to invite you to do not homework, but pre-work, all right? So if you can read one chapter a week in preparation for Sunday worship, read, it's five chapters, so you can just whiz right through it. But you can also, I invite you to write questions in the margin of your Bible, in a journal that you have. Wrestle with it. Say, James, James why would you say that? What's at stake? I wonder why you wrote it. I disagree. Like, just engage the scriptures. Also notice, where is your attention drawn to? Because that's often when the Holy Spirit is trying to communicate. It's trying to nudge you towards something. So over the next five weeks, I invite you to, um, to read a chapter in preparation for worship. So before we dive into the book of James, we need to know who James is. Amen? We have to know who our traveling partner is going to be. We need some background and some context to sort of set the stage for the practical wisdom on the book of James. Um, so as you may know, James is found in the latter part of your New Testament Bibles. Um, James is actually a letter. It's an epistle. Um, and really, there's kind of these two kinds of letters in the New Testament. Either it was a letter written to a community, like Corinthians was written to a church in Corinth, or you had such sort of clout as an early church leader that you could write the letter and you could name it after yourself, amen? And so that's what James has done. He was a pretty pivotal figure in the early church. The book of James is one of the earliest writings that we have in our New Testament writing collections. It was written about 40 AD. Um, so who was James? James was the brother of Jesus. Now, most biblical scholars believe that to be true. Amen? Um, the consen I would say the consensus. Anytime you're talking about biblical sort of authorship or dates, you're going to have a little bit of wiggle room among the biblical scholarship. Um, but that is most, where most biblical scholars land. And so you may remember Mark 6, chapter 3 says this. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and, bro and the brother of James? So we're talking about Jesus, right? Is this not the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and are not his sisters here with us? So Jesus was one of about seven in his family. Now, can we just take it? So it was Jesus was born first, then James, and then you hear Joseph and Judas, and then on down with some, with some sisters sprinkled in. May I just say that this for me is compelling evidence that Jesus was truly who the Bible says he was. That this truly was, that Jesus was the son of God. Why? Because imagine for a moment, what would it take for you to believe that your brother or sister, your sibling was the son of God? Amen? Just think about for a moment, what would, what would it take, Emma, for you to believe that Ethan was the son of God? Amen? It would have to be, yeah, see, amen. It would have to be unbelievably compelling for me to believe that. Um, and that is what James does. He believes that Jesus is who the Bible says he was. And so, it, and it, I think probably the most um, compelling, you know, experience that allowed him to believe this is reflected in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says that um, the risen Christ, the resurrected Jesus, appeared to Peter, the 500, to James, and all the apostles. 
So James actually saw, you know, Jesus resurrected. And I'm sure for him that like, he maybe was on the fence, right? He was like, I don't know, you know, he teased me a whole bunch. He beat me in kickball all growing up, right? But that for him pushed him over the edge of belief that he was who he said he was. All right, so that's some background on the book of James. Are we ready to dive into the first chapter? Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. Um, so James, um, I particularly want to hold up verses 12 and 13 and 14. So I'm going to read, just read them quickly. Blessed is anyone who endures temptation. Such a one as stood the test will receive the crown of life. No one when tempted should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire, being lured and enticed by it. When you look over the first chapter, thank you for throwing that up there, you will see these two words sort of rise to the surface throughout the first chapter of James. And those are the two that I want to, I want to parse out. And those are the, the words test and tempt. Um, so first, let's ask the question of the scripture. Why did James find it necessary, feel compelled to distinguish between these two words, these two experiences? You have to know a little more of the background. James is writing predominantly to a group of people who grew up, were formed in the Jewish faith, and then they accepted Christianity. And so maybe to a small part or a significant experience, they were experiencing stressors or hardship, maybe because of life, but also because of their newfound faith. So these, because they were people who were trying to follow Jesus, they asked this question. They said, where is God? in the midst of this challenging situation in my life? Where is God in the midst of this challenging experience? And James is responding to that question in the very first chapter when he teases out the difference between a test and a temptation. So first, a test. The word test is used throughout scripture to experience a circumstance where somebody had a struggle or a stressor um, or a difficult situation and still chose to follow God, even if it was just hanging on by a thread at times. And through that, through that difficulty, God brought about some increased measure of maturity, of wisdom, and awareness of the faithfulness of God. So the Israelites wandering 40 years in the wilderness is an example of a test time. Remember, they had to rely, they'd be like, I'm thirsty, and God would provide water in the middle of the desert, or I'm hungry, and God would provide manna or quail. They learned more fully to rely upon God during the test time. But before we go any further, if we're going to use the word God and test in the same phraseology, we have to unpack it a little bit. And I was reminded of this. I remember I was speaking with a, a, a couple at a previous church I served named Brenda and Kevin. And they had gone through a very difficult experience in their family. Their youngest child, their youngest son, um, was diagnosed and struggled with an aggressive form of cancer called neuroblastoma. Um, and I remember her sharing with me that during the months of the treatments, um, and staying in the hospital, um, she said, I experienced the absolute best of the church and of what human, humans empowered by God could, could do and could avail. She said, I, I never have seen people give and be present so generously. And it reminded me of how present God was with me during that time. And so she said that, but she also said that there were some well-meaning folks who maybe should have chosen silence over the option to speak, amen, would say to her, you know, I think God just may be testing you right now. 
Um, and I'm sure you're going to grow from this. Woo! She said, well, I had lost my filter a long time ago. And she said to them, God is not testing me. God is not placing my child on the altar so that we can grow. You know, and she came to me and she said, I, she said, I am so bothered by this statement. And we talked about it and we prayed about it. And we decided what was so bothersome about this was the image of God that it implied. As if God was sitting upon some distant cloud somewhere, remote and removed from our everyday lives, would look down and say, oh, it looks as if Kevin and Brenda really need to stretch themselves as a married couple. Zap. No, God does not zap us with hardship or struggle. But in this fallen world, you know, in this fallen world where there is brokenness, conflicts emerge, misunderstandings happen, diagnoses come, tragedy occurs, and God does allow some of these struggles to happen. God does allow, and then we have the choice of how we're going to respond so that from the rubble and the potential pain can come newness and wisdom and peace and hope. Maybe it is a semantic difference for some people, the difference between God causing and God allowing, but to me it makes all the difference. You know, this is, we can be sure of, if we are in a season of testing, it is not to tear us up down or to leave us depressed or hopeless. Rather than causing the pain, God is with us during the test times, sustaining us and walking with us, and then also bringing about some measure of greater trust and a hope that nothing can take away. You know, I was in a Bible study once, and um, we drew what's called a faith map. Right? And so um, we had two lines we had to draw. One was of the highs of your life and the lows in your life. So, you know, the first child was adopted, and that's a high. Um, you know, the time that the, the company division folded and we had to look for a new job, that was a low. And folks just sort of mapped the course of their lives. That was the first line. And the second dotted line was when and how did you feel closest to God throughout your life? And so they, they charted this, and it was a great way to sort of get to know people um, in the church. But we looked back, and as we realized, we noticed a common thread emerge. Where do you think people felt closest to God? It was in the valleys. It was, it was, it was during those moments. Maybe it, maybe it caused us to turn our head to the God who's always there in the peaks and the valleys. It was so funny. We sat around as we really is the pattern really sunk into our spirits and everyone sort of looked at each other and we said thank you god for the hard-earned wisdom we never want to do any of that stuff again amen but we thank you that you were with us and there is a measure of strength that still remains because of it it's the test times where is god in the midst of it you know interesting and if you look at the greek in, with, in which the book of James was written. The very same word um, translated as test, it's the very same word that also can be translated as tempt. Same word. And what the biblical translators, they would make a decision whether or not to make it test or tempt, depending upon the context in which the word was written. You know, and it, it reminded me that during times of struggle and stress in our lives or in the lives of our family, that's often when temptation tries to get more of a foothold, more of a stronghold in our lives. And really temptation, really what it attempts to do is chip away, you know, at, at sort of at, at valuing it, having a relationship with loved ones, with ourselves, with our bodies, with our world, ultimately with God. That's what temptation seeks to do. It just seeks to chip, chip, chip in order to break those significant relationships. You know, James is really crystal clear. I don't know if you heard it. He is crystal clear on the source of temptation. God does not do the tempting. 
God does not sort of keep company with evil or sin. It comes from an inherent distortion within ourselves and from the enemy of God. But as much as that God is for us and strengthening us and urging us to look to God for the strength to keep on the path. You know, James writes this chapter in large part in response to the question, where is God in the midst of these stressors or struggles that at times can just stretch us and other times sort of double us over? Where is God? And James writes um, to tell us that God is with us. And as the scriptures say, if God is with us, truly who can be against us? Amen. Let us pray.